Napoleon is a man who polarizes public opinion. To some, he is a womanizing misogynist who brought Europe to ruination through a series of ever-increasing brutal wars, a traitor to the very point of his nation's revolution. To others, he is the natural conclusion of the French Revolution. To Ridley Scott, he must have been a joke. Because, good grief, that was the worst movie I have ever seen. And as I sit here, with a glass of scotch, watching the movie Waterloo, writing this script after watching Napoleon, I don't know how to feel, other than pure, unadulterated rage, and just complete disappointment. And to those people who say, well, it's just a movie, it isn't even a good one at that. And the problem with saying it's just a movie, historical accuracy doesn't matter, is that people will take this and they will try and learn from it. Because naturally, human minds will remember things with big spectacles. I want to point out something. How many of you believe that Isoroko Yamamoto said that all the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor did was awaken a sleeping giant? I'd wager quite a few of you believe that he said that. He never did. It's a made-up quote from Tora 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 when the evidence of which was asked to be produced to say that he made that quote, the director never produced it. In 2001, I believe it was when Pearl Harbor came out, the director admitted that he copied Tora Tora Tora. This is how historical mistruth is spread, and I for one am not here for it. And on that, Pearl Harbor is a better movie than Napoleon. Yeah, I said it. So the movie begins with the execution of Marie Antoinette for the reasons... Seriously, I don't know why this spot was chosen in the year 1793. And speaking of, they did the scene totally wrong as well. For one, Napoleon wasn't actually there watching. Also, it wasn't done in a smallish little town square. It was done at the Place de la Concorde. You know, 30 seconds in and they haven't even bothered to try. We then find out out of nowhere that Napoleon is going to Toulon to fight the invaders. The invaders being, well, the English. Ignoring the Neapolitans and everyone else that was there. And the reason why... They were there in the first place. Yeah, Ridley Scott does this a lot in Napoleon. He just ignores the why. And the why is that Toulon was a royalist stronghold and the royalist forces who dominated the French naval command offered up the French fleet to join the Royal Navy in an attempt to avoid the literal reign of terror and to fight against the revolution as an ally because, well, it's no secret, Britain was dead against the French Revolution. Scott also makes out that a British fleet was just walloped and destroyed during Napoleon's little foray in Toulon which didn't happen. In fact, the French fleet was burned by fire ships and then the British fleet left because the Republicans had taken the city. Napoleon, while a key part in the Battle of Toulon, wasn't the be-all and end-all of it. The film makes out that he was the only saving hope and that he and his merry men, not really many men, and there weren't many men on screen, saved France and everyone was doomed if he hadn't interjected. It's true that Napoleon, like I said, played a part in the Battle of Toulon, but there was so much more at stake there. There were so many other factors. There were so many other French commanders there. So back to Paris we go, and Napoleon is staring at a random woman in a room. The camera lingers for far too long to the point where I would start wanting to press sexual assault charges, and this sequence takes forever, but their eyes finally meet. Now, the politics surrounding Josephine and Napoleon's marriage is quite complex, and the reason for their marriage is argued. But what cannot be argued is that as a French noblewoman, she gave Napoleon, a Corsican, more legitimacy, and due to, shall we say, rumoured indiscretions, his connection to the French ruling class through his new wife put him in a position of being given command of an essential backwater army, but it was poised, crucially, on the Italian border. The Italian campaign is where Napoleon really cuts his teeth and becomes known as a true, well, powerhouse in the French military space. The film completely ignores the Italian campaign and it doesn't even mention it, save for the Italians didn't bother to fight. It's quite literally Toulon, Paris, marriage, back to Egypt. The mission of Italy is a joke. Like I said, it is Italy where Napoleon's military prowess as a commander is truly on display for the first time, and the film does such a disservice by omitting this. You think the glaring omission of Italy is bad though? No, no, this movie gets so much worse. So now we are straight to Egypt. Panning shot on the pyramid, Napoleon fires his guns at the top of the Great Pyramid, making rocks and debris fall on the Mamluk army, and then 360 no-scopes the Mamluk leader. He has dinner with an officer, because, yeah, at no point does Ridley actually bother to introduce the marshals correctly, like, they're just sort of there? And finds out Josephine is having an affair, and then he runs away back to France. That's it. That's all of the Egypt campaign. Nothing more is said about Egypt. It is genuinely like a three to seven minute sequence. Nelson, the Royal Navy blockade, nah, never happened. He had found out his wife was having an affair and he ran away. 
just ignored for the entire movie. Ridley Scott does not even bring up the Battle of Trafalgar. At all. Not even once. But it's about to get worse. Don't worry, it's going to get worse. Napoleon is now made First Consul in a little coup that is probably the only good bit of the movie. Remember that little quote that I opened with though? Yeah, that's a genuine line. That's a genuine line of the movie. But as First Consul, he's meeting ambassadors and he's having a chat with them. And uh, the interaction with the British ambassador is probably the funniest thing I've ever seen in film. Not like ha ha funny, just like wow you you really did that? You actually put that in a film? But yeah that little quote I opened with yep that's a line from the movie. Insert a random sex scene because Ridley Scott does that all the time and it's always all okay the sex scenes in this movie one I mean I get you kind of want to do them because you're covering the marriage between Josephine and Napoleon it was pretty raunchy. But why is it just Joaquin Phoenix flopping around like a wet fish on a completely dead and docile woman who doesn't want anything to do with him? Like, I get that Napoleon and Josephine had a weird relationship, but you're trying to portray them as madly in love, and then you do that? Are we self-inserting your marriage troubles, Ridley Scott? But anyway, now we get to Austerlitz. Austerlitz is the greatest moment in Napoleon's career. The tactics employed by Napoleon here are why so many people believe him to be an incredible commander. At about this point, my burger arrived to my seat. Yes, I booked the premium lounge for this because I needed some kind of comfort because of the headache this was giving me. And the burger was pretty good, not gonna lie. Onions on it, very nicely caramelized. That was the highlight of the entire Austerlitz scene was my burger. The scene was that bad, all I could think about was my burger. The battle sequence would have you believe Napoleon lured the entire Russian slash Austrian army, which was really small. Like, what the fuck, Ridley? You have CGI and you shrunk over 70,000 men into maybe 5,000 or so on screen onto a frozen lake and then blew it up, killing them all. The scene is over in about five minutes and it is just so damn disappointing. In reality, not that many people died when the ice over the Sachin Ponds broke. It was really not that many. And those who were drowning were actually saved by French soldiers, which again is completely omitted. We are treated to a bout in this movie. Uh... By far the weirdest damn sequence and scene I've ever seen in film. I'll try and animate it for you so you can see it. Uh, I'll run this by a couple of people who have watched the movie, and I'm sure they'll agree that it's quite accurate. So, um... Enjoy, I guess? New in my hair. Okay, come here. Bit weirder than the chicken commercial if you remember that. When you see the movie, you will know I did not exaggerate that scene. And like, look, I'm married, my wife and I say dumb shit to each other all the time, but this is just weird, and it kind of feels like again a bit of a self-insert. Like, it's just it's just really weird. It was so unnecessary, and it's weird. Napoleon and Josephine were then just divorced because, well, she couldn't get pregnant. And then we cut to a meeting between Napoleon and Tsar Alexander saying how bad the English are and they need to cut trade to Britain. We cut back to France where Napoleon now meets his new wife. It is about a 30 second sequence of her walking in, him saying, yo babes, what a bone. And then you literally never see her again. Like you never see his second wife ever again. Weird thing. The very next scene is invading Russia. There is no explanation, it's just Alliance, Bone New Wife, Invasion of Russia. Huh? Gonna put anything in the middle there? Gonna maybe explain why relations are falling apart? Nah, just invade Russia. At the risk of sounding unpopular given the current situation, the depiction of Russian forces in this movie is pretty damn horrific. Moscow is shown to look drab and dreary, none of the fanciful colours on the churches that it is known for. But above all, the army, which is portrayed as mostly Cossacks, you know, from the areas that we now call Ukraine and the Don and the Caucasus and such, they're all portrayed to be from that region. And they're all portrayed to be dirty savages, like Genghis Khan style. Filthy, unbathed, brutal, murderous. I wasn't comfortable with the depiction. We'll put it that way. 
it was very dehumanising. Napoleon now gets to Moscow after the Battle of Borodino, which is nothing like the actual battle, and it looks like the film sort of based this battle off the Battle of Marengo, but, I mean, Ridley doesn't even mention the Italy campaign, so, you know, meh. Moscow then catches fire, he marches back to Poland, and then he abdicates. My wife turned to me in the theatre right about now, and said, Am I missing something? Yes. Quite a bit. No Malyoslavets, no Berenzia, he just leaves Russia. That's it, he walks out. And now we get to the first of the two most glaring omissions from this film just horrifically ignored very important things. The first one is the Battle of Leipzig, the Battle of Nations, where Sweden, Prussia, Austria, and Russia joined forces and defeated Napoleon, the alliance that advanced on Paris, forcing Napoleon into a fighting retreat and then finally exile on the island of Elbe. It is such an important part of Napoleon's story. It is so important. It's where his marshals arguably turn on him. It's where he is forced to abdicate and give up. It is so quintessential to the story, though. But this pales in comparison to the biggest issue I have with the history of this movie. Spain. There is not, at any point, a single mention of Spain. Spain is quite literally known as the Spanish Ulcer for Napoleon. The guerrilla war fought by the Spanish, Portuguese, and their British allies against Napoleon sapped around a quarter of his empire's resources. It was crippling. To willfully ignore this is just disgusting. Modern Spain was truly born during this period. The battles that took place, the combat in the hills and the passes, the destruction of the French armies in Spain, were very much a linchpin in the defeat of Napoleon, as the forces he lost were unable to stand against Central Europe at Leipzig and were unable to defend him from being forced into exile. Spain is not mentioned a single time in this film. How do you make a Napoleon movie and ignore Spain? Now we are treated to a moody sequence of Napoleon on the island of Elbe before he comes back, and in the most emotionless scene I've ever seen in theatre, he's met on the road by like 100, 150 men. Again, there's not many men on screen at any point from the 5th, and, like, really, you had CGI. What's your excuse? You had CGI. You have no excuse. First hand sources, whilst likely embellished, have Napoleon during the sequence in history literally ripping open his coat and loudly proclaiming, If any of you will shoot his emperor, here I am. Scott's movie was just boring. He daintily sort of whisks open his coat and said something so unmemorable, I can't even recall it. Oh, it's finally revealed that Josephine's dead at this point, too. Like, no, no, no one cared. There's no emotion. No one is worth being attached to. Although Vanessa Kirby was trying to carry this movie so damn hard. I feel so sorry and I want to buy her a drink for this. She, she did not deserve this film. And now we get to Waterloo. Yeah, I can't even remotely begin to explain how shit this sequence was. And I mean, I admit I have a bias. I'm hypercritical of Waterloo. I have an ancestor who was at Waterloo and was noted for distinction in combat, part of the 92nd Gordon Highland Regiment. You know, I'm a little biased here. I like a battle where the good guys win, but I'm a little biased in the sense that, you know, I want it done properly. I want Waterloo done properly, you know, like the 1970 movie Waterloo. And I actually got up and went to pee during the middle of the Battle of Waterloo. I was that bored. It was not great. How do you get bored in the middle of Waterloo? <laughs> it's Waterloo. A famous sequence of events that happened at Waterloo, though, was Napoleon rode in range of the British cannons, upon which the Duke of Wellington was asked for permission to take a shot. His response was to say, no, as commanders of armies have better things to do than to shoot at one another. Now, the movie includes this, but it's a sniper with a sniper rifle in 1815. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
There are also trench lines at Waterloo, like proper brace trench lines that look like they belong in at least the US Civil War, if not World War I. Yeah, they're shallow, so they're not very good trenches, but they're still trenches, and it's... Again, it's Waterloo. A five-second look on bloody Wikipedia will tell you the ground was so soaked they probably couldn't dig trenches and no one had time to prepare. The whole battle scene, though, was just a joke. The Prussians were on screen for half the time it takes a mouse to fart, and then, and then Napoleon <laughs> charges on horseback with Ney into the British lines. This didn't happen. It didn't happen. Before finally holding his sword up in the air and retreating. We are then treated to a stupid scene where Napoleon meets Wellington on HMS Bellerophon. Well, it's supposed to be Bellerophon. Th this scene serves no purpose. They never met. It is pure fabricated bullshit to have the Duke of Wellington explain why Napoleon was going to exile on St. Helena. It just was not needed. It, it doesn't even add to the movie. Like, it, it's just not a good sequence. I understand historical, like, artistic liberty. Go for it. But, like, I'm going to add something to the film, at least. Oh, and on St. Helena, in a fitting manner... They show Napoleon dying in the dumbest way possible. He literally falls over. And that's it. That is Ridley Scott's $200 million pissed away down the drain. It is the worst movie I have ever seen. This movie is a mockery of history, but not only that, it is just a bad movie. But we get to a point that I think is really, really important here. And that is the depiction of people. Now, Napoleon was an absolute pig with women and quite the misogynist. This is not a secret. But the depiction of him is just pure Elliot Rogers level of incel. Above all, though, Ridley Scott's depiction of Josephine is purely disgusting. She is known as nothing more throughout the film as a whore. Words exactly from the script. There is no mention of her love and patronage of the arts. Nothing about her efforts in revitalizing French culture in the wake of the destruction wrought by the revolution. Josephine was the grandmother of Napoleon III, the second emperor of the French, or the second recognized one. She made huge contributions to French society and culture. She survived the hell that was the reign of terror, the same reign that murdered her first husband. And yet Ridley Scott chose to represent her, this empress of the French, who had to deal with an arsehole of a husband as a simple cheating whore on a devoted, amazing Napoleon all but ignoring the countless affairs Bonaparte had had, with exception of a single throwaway line. This movie is a disgusting perversion of history for the purpose of nothing more than a paycheck. And the problem, like I said, with historical inaccuracy to this level is that people are going to watch this movie and believe it. In a post-truth world, do not be a Ridley Scott. A movie doesn't have to be perfectly historical to be good. The film Master and Commander is a work of fiction, yet it is the greatest historical epic I have ever seen, and I will die on that hill. It represents history to a way that is so authentic that the story of fiction does not matter. Another incredible film that I've spoken about and will be on screen quite a lot is the 1970s film Waterloo, which you can watch for free on YouTube. It is much, much, much more worth watching. And that's a far better portrayal of Bonaparte than this monstrosity. And yes, the movie itself, like I said, is just bad. Ignoring the history, it is just a bad movie. Like, comment, subscribe. I'm never watching Napoleon again.